Welcome to PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. It's greatly appreciated. In this video, we're going to discuss biological control testing, which is an essential part of a PFT lab's quality assurance program. We'll review the basis for BioQC testing and show you how to start and manage your own program. So what is biological control testing? Well, BioQC testing is using human subjects for quality control of pulmonary function systems. BioQC subjects should be adult non-smoking staff members without a history of respiratory disease or ongoing chronic illnesses. You want to choose uh, subjects who are pretty reliable, so if you have a staff member who seems to change jobs every year and a half, you might not want to pick them. Um, if a staff member has stable controlled asthma, that might be acceptable. Uh, you'd also want to be on the lookout for anyone who has chronic anemia, fluctuating hemoglobin, as that could also affect the BioQC of DLCO. After getting a volunteer from the staff, a series of measurements are made to determine if the staff member is actually a good candidate to function as a BioQC subject and to establish normal ranges for that individual. Once normal ranges are established, the BioQC subject repeats testing weekly and the recorded value is compared to their normal range. If the recorded value is within their normal range, the system is in control. If not, the system is out of control and troubleshooting must be done before any patient testing is performed. Why is BioQC testing so important? Well, BioQC tests test the pulmonary function system under patient testing conditions, which might be different from a QC mode or a calibration. And a uh, pulmonary function system can have measurement errors and still pass calibration checks. And I'll show you an example of this now. Depicted here is the results of cal verification data uh, on a PFT system prior to DLCO BioQC testing. Both the spirometer and the gas analyzers pass calibration verification. Following calibration verification, the BioQC subject performs two DLCO maneuvers. They are both acceptable and reproducible. However, when we take this data and we put it into the Levy Jennings plot of this biological control subject, we see that the DLCO is much higher than the normal range despite passing cal verification and performing the test correctly. And the same holds true for the alveolar volume that's calculated from the DLCO test. You can see the last data point is much higher than the BioQC's usual range. The DLCO and alveolar volume were higher than normal in this BioQC subject because there was a hole in the bag that collects the alveolar sample. Now I poked a hole in the bag purposefully for teaching purposes, but this illustrates how you can have a measurement error even though the calibration verifications pass and the test was done without any error messages. One of the first questions that comes up when you're getting started is, is which systems need BioQC testing? Well, you should do BioQC testing on your spirometer. So you can either follow FVC or SVC. I tend to follow slow vital capacity. Your DLCO system, and you want to follow both the DLCO and the alveolar volume. Uh, lung volume systems, whether you're using plethysmography, nitrogen washout or helium dilution, you can follow the FRC and or the TLC. I tend to follow just the TLC. And if you're doing cardiopulmonary exercise testing, you can check the oxygen consumption and CO2 production at 50% of the predicted workload. When starting your BioQC program, subjects should have a minimum of 20 measurements, although more is better, recorded on separate days. You don't want to do 20 measurements over two days. They should be on separate days. It's also probably important to avoid testing at the same time every day because there are diurnal changes in some pulmonary function values, primarily DLCO, and you may need to perform BioQC at different times of the day when the system error is suspected or needs to be ruled out. So for example, DLCO tends to go down as a normal part of the day. So if you're always doing uh, your BioQC at 6.30 a.m. and then you have a suspected problem at 4 p.m. and you repeat BioQC testing, it may be a little off because as the day goes on, your DLCO will go down. So that's why it's probably a good idea to test people at, at different times of the day. Don't always do it at the same time of the day, and you'll have a better average of what your daily DLCO might be. Once 20 or more measurements are made, basic statistical analysis should be performed to determine if the BioQC subject is suitable, and if so, determine their normal range. 
So the basic statistical numbers we're going to need are the coefficient of variation, or CV, the mean, or average value, and we'll need to generate a two or three standard deviation range. Some of you may be asking, well, where do I do these statistical computations? Well, you can use statistical software, of course. You can also use Microsoft Excel. There are also some online calculators. I use GraphPad statistical software. If you go to graphpad.com and look for quick calcs, you can do a lot of these calculations for free online. And also westguard.com has a lot of resources so you can calculate these things very easily. In the left side of the slide, you can see that I listed BioQC DLCO in its own column. And then I choose column statistics. And here are the results. You can see the number of values in the top is 38. Um, and I've highlighted the mean or the average value from the data, the standard deviation, and then the coefficient of variation at the bottom is 3.93%. The coefficient of variation is important because it helps to determine if the BioQC's data is too variable for them to serve as a BioQC subject. It's very easy to calculate. It's just the standard deviation divided by the mean. If the CV is greater than 5%, the subject may not be suitable for BioQC testing because their data is just too, too variable. Now, this is where you can run into problems if you don't have a large enough sample. So as I said earlier, you should have at least 20, more is better, uh, data points before you make these calculations. If you're only using 10, you may have a falsely wide CV and exclude someone who actually would serve um, as a good BioQC subject. The data you collect from a BioQC subject is not always going to be the same number, so you need to establish a range for each individual BioQC subject. To do this, we use a two or three standard deviation range above or below the mean value. This will serve as the normal range for the BioQC subject. I use a three standard deviation range for BioQC testing. It's a little wider, and in my experience, you'll get fewer false alarms. Let's talk about using standard deviations as a normal range. Firstly, it's not enough just to look at data and say, yeah, that's in the ballpark just by eyeballing it. You really need to establish a statistical range. So let's get started. Shown here are multiple vital capacity measurements made on different days. They all appear relatively close, but they are clearly not the same. If we add up all the recorded values and divide by the number of measurements, we can determine the mean vital capacity, which in this example is 4 liters. Once we determine the mean value, we can draw a line through the data points representing the mean, and we can visualize how far each individual value is from the mean value. Simply stated, the average distance of the data points from the mean is one standard deviation. Here are two data sets of vital capacity. Both have a mean value of 4 liters. In the upper example, you can see that the data points are much closer to the mean line so there's less variability, there's less distance away from the mean, so the standard deviation is smaller. In this case, 0 0.05 liters. In the lower example, once again, you still have a mean vital capacity of 4 liters, but it's easy to see that the data points are much farther away from the mean line. There's more variability, so the standard deviation is going to be larger. In this case, 0.2 liters. So what's the rationale of using a two or three standard deviation range as our normal range for BioQC data? I think it's best to visualize this data in a bell curve where the mean value is the line passing through the center of the bell curve. It's important to use two or three standard deviations as our normal range because the empirical rule states that under normal conditions, if everything's operating correctly, 68% of repeated measurements should fall within one standard deviation from the center of the bell curve. 95% of repeated measurements should fall within two standard deviations from the center of the bell curve. And 99.7% of repeated measurements should fall within three standard deviations from the center of the bell curve. So if you choose two standard deviations as the normal range for your BioQC subject, if your PFT system is operating normally and your BioQC subject is still healthy, 95% of future BioQC measurements should be within two standard deviations from the mean. If a BioQC value is just outside of that two standard deviation range, that should only occur in 5% or 1 in 20 measurements if everything is operating correctly. 
I use a three standard deviation range because if the PFT system is operating normally, nearly 100% of bioQC measurements should fall within three standard deviations of the mean. If they don't, whether you're using two or three standard deviations, then the system should be taken out of service and troubleshooting should begin. So how should we document our bioQC data? Well, you could simply put the data in a spreadsheet with normal ranges. Uh, if you want to go really low tech, you could make it like a paper worksheet and do it that way. But ideally, you should plot all this data in a Levy Jennings graph, just like we'd use for blood gas quality control data. And when you look at a Levy Jennings graph, really what we're doing is just turning that bell curve that I showed you earlier right on its side. So the mean value goes to the middle of the, the bell curve. And you can see each end of the bell curve is the three standard deviation range. One of the benefits of a Levy Jennings graph is it helps you analyze the data more easily. So as you can see right here, this is a random error just outside of the two standard deviation range, keeping in mind that even when things are operating correctly, using two standard deviations, one in 20 measurements might be slightly out of that range. A Levy Jennings graph also allows you to identify things like a shift. So up in here, you can see these data points have shifted from the previous measurements and that may indicate that there's been a change in function in the system even though the values have not fallen outside of that normal range. You can also identify trends so as shown here you can see that the numbers are progressively falling and even though they haven't fallen out of the normal range this kind of pattern can indicate that you may have a developing problem. A common question is, how do I make a Levy Jennings uh, chart? Um, for myself, I use the GraphPad statistical software, so I can do that within that. But if you don't have statistical software, you can still easily do it. There are all kinds of online resources. And even here on YouTube, if you just put in how to make a Levy Jennings chart, uh, a number of videos are available to show you how to do it, both in Excel and in Microsoft Word. Another common question is how often should BioQC testing be performed? Well, it certainly shouldn't be something you just do now and then if you think there might be a problem. It needs to be done on a regular basis. The latest ERS ATS standard on lung volume measurements said that lung volume BioQC should be done at least monthly. To me, that is not frequent enough. Uh, if you do it monthly and you identify a problem, that could be several weeks of patient testing where the results might not be accurate. The ERS ATS standard says that DLCO BioQC should be done weekly and you have to do some sort of spirometry measurement of vital capacity to do a DLCO. So if you're doing the spirometry and the DLCO weekly, you might as well just do the lung volumes at the same time. And that's how I do it. And that's my recommendation that it should be done at least weekly. And of course, if you suspect there might be a problem, sometimes I see patients whose numbers look higher than they should be. Um, it just takes a moment to test yourself just to make sure the system's operating well. And that's the whole point of doing BioQC is to ensure that patient uh, data and testing is accurate. Key points, BioQC is an essential part of a quality assurance program. As I showed earlier, BioQC may reveal system errors even if calibration verifications pass. I hope I've convinced you that a BioQC program is easy to establish and manage. Performing weekly BioQC protects your patients against inaccurate data, which can result in misdiagnosis, unnecessary diagnostics like chest CT, and poor clinical decision making. Thank you for watching PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons, and we'll see you next time.